Thank you very much, Ildegun. And uh, hello, everyone on site. Hello, everyone online. And uh, I hope uh, internet will support us for a little while, at least. So I would like to start uh, with showing you a painting which freshly uh, come out of the studio just maybe two days before uh, traveling and arriving in Salzburg. This painting is called uh, Migration Pride and it's, uh, I produce it, I mean it's a commission by the Stadtmuseum Berlin which invited a group of artists to react on two uh, Friese uh, work which are uh, in Berlin. Uh, one has been made, let's say, in the 19th century in the frame of, uh, let's say, nationalist uh, movement, development, and the other one is uh, made during the DDR, which I don't know how you say this in English, uh, GDR probably, and um, so those those two frees, let's say, ask offer two, two different points of view, and are putting this question: how history is written and from which perspective. So to tell a bit about my my own context, I'm living in Berlin. Actually, I'm living in Brandenburg, and I'm coming from a multicultural background. I'm half French, half Indian, and I have a, a Muslim background. So I'm a Métis, I'm a second generation migrant according to, let's say, demogra demographic statistics, and I grew mainly in France among a post-migration, like a post-migration communities. So what can I say myself about the history of Berlin? This is quite uh, hard and challenging. Uh, and what can I say about the past, you know, of a city where I haven't been really living or my family is not really connected to. So I decided to uh, address what is very important for me, which is cultures of migration. And I've been searching in the collection of the Stadtmuseum Berlin and observing that there is absolutely nothing about the history of, uh, of migration there. So, yes, yeah, so this painting, uh, which is pretty straightforward, is coming from the lack of representation of cultures of migration in the museum. Uh, and I have to add also that myself, I'm pretty much involved in certain groups which are working against racism and uh, which valorize cultures of migration in the city of Berlin. So the painting is, uh, itself works like, uh, let's say, a public space painting, even though it is on, on, on stretcher bars. And it works with, like, it has a kind of a narrative structure, uh, because I'm trying to also answer the, the freeze challenge, you know. It, it works like a billboard. It has a clear intention to make a statement and to represent, um, let's say, a certain uh, vision uh, yes, I see. Yeah, I don't scare my yeah. screen. Yeah. I mean, sorry for you online, I was not sharing my screen. Now I'm sharing my screen, but I didn't change images, so you are not losing anything. So, yes, it's, there is a, I can make a clear, let's say, statement, and I send a clear wish. And let's say, I would say there is a bit of a performative and a wish of magic, you know, uh, in the sense of doing this painting. So it's a triptych. The first, uh, which, so three, three parts and several chapters. One part address, let's say, the whole uh, phenomenon of displacement, uh, of movement of population, nothing to be afraid of. This exists in so many, many, many since humankind somehow exist. Then uh, a chapter is uh, dealing with the whole idea of um, bureaucracy that can happen uh, in process of migration. Uh, another chapter, I would call it exotic exhaustion. So this, is, this chapter uh, would like to address, let's say, that sometimes 
people who experience migration become also somehow post-colonial subject of study in certain academic field, but still they are real human beings, you know, they are not only academic topics. And beyond, we would like uh, go through, let's say, what I would call museum cultural appropriation. So let's say that museum have, let's say, a tendency to appropriate migration better than, let's say, society or uh, legal institutions. And you can see that, yes, I want to really also address the museum uh, responsibility and the gaze of, in general. And we see here, maybe you recognize that Nefertiti is kind of staring at us and uh, since she is in Berlin, I think 1910 or 1913, she is claimed back by Egypt, but still is there. And I mean, after being there so many years, she starts to wear Adidas because something happened when you migrate so long in the place. And she's standing in front of the Ishtar Gate, which is also um, a Babylonian, you know, like gigantic city who is also stuck somehow in a museum in Berlin. I mean, uh, next to that starts culture of resistance, you know, take the space, the whole politics representing in the scene of a demonstration. And we end with what is probably the most important community building. So that was a way like somehow, I think, a good introduce, uh, introduction to a bit show you where I somehow stand with my practice. I would like now to uh, travel a bit with you in this exhibition Hildegun mentioned in Heidelberg, which just closed, uh, um, yes, actually this weekend. So this show was, um, I mean, I was lucky enough to win a, a prize, and part of the prize was a, a solo show. And instead of just doing the solo show, I invited two, uh, two artists, uh, two colleagues of mine, Varunika Saraf and Amina Ahmed, and we wanted to speak about transculturality. And transculturality rooted in Indian and Indian diasporic migration background. The show is called uh, Confluence Sangam, Sangam in India, in Hindi, in Urdu, is a, a word which is, let's say, very much, which is popular to address this multicultural uh, gathering of all the different cultures which are sharing like the, the presence and the existence on the Indian subcontinent. So I go quickly, I just want to show you just to have a, a, an image, this is a, like one work of Veronica Saraf, who is uh, very inspired and trained as a, um, with a uh, tradition of uh, Indo-Persian uh, miniatures. And Amina Ahmed, who has a totally uh, abstract uh, vocabulary. And I'm just going now to show you a bit like my part in the show. We all had separate rooms. So the space in Heidelberg is quite a, a complex space, like with a very dominant architecture. And uh, my work, I mean, my painting practice, I would say is somehow expanded. That means that from the classical use of painting in the frame, I go, I try to re relate, you know, to to the space. I work also somehow in situ with architecture, or also sometimes with other objects. I work picturally on other material than just painting. So let's just go a bit that to, through the show that you have a bit uh, an impression of how things were were installed. So there are some paintings, some clothes, some turtles, big curtains that has been specifically made for the, for the, for the room, table vitrines. This is the back view of the show when you are at the back of the space. I mean, let's say, opposite the entrance, another curtain. The curtains are facing each other. We see a bit closer the combination of painting, large painting on the wall, painting on the structure, clothes and objects. This piece on the floor is a ceramic tile floor. And those are 
inkjet prints on t tarp. And we will look more carefully at the works. We also created a library, a corner where we are also bringing some of our, let's say, beloved texts, in source of inspiration. This was downstairs. And on the wall are the reproduction of a Mughal miniature manuscript, which is called the Hamza Nama, but we will speak about that later also as well. So, Batard, Batard as Ildugun also mentioned, uh, maybe you see it, I'm wearing the T-shirt today. So this is what I would call a concept form. And uh, batard mean bastard, but I use the French to be able to put a feminine um, qualification to it. I see batard as a mantra, a performative empowering, empowering word, a claim for a space which break with patriarchy and where hybridity, let's say hybrid identities, not only hybrid formats, you know, is sovereign. It's also related to Bata. Maybe some of you know that Bata has been, I mean, is still a shoe brand from Czech Republic that's sold in many countries in the world, but somehow have a different uh, social status according to the country where they distribute their shoes. So Bata in France is perceived differently than Bata in Egypt or Bata in India. So I'm trying to connect the global phenomenon of Bata uh, to the empowering uh, Batard space. And I have to say that I'm making art from the perspective of a batard, and I've fully embraced my cultural hybrid status, which is full of ambivalence, uh, mimicry, and sometimes a lot of nostalgia as well. And we can see here, this is one of the vitrines, the, one of the tables which were in the show. This is a piece which is called Global Bastard Education. It consists of jeans on the background, the pockets are soon in the jeans, kalamkari, which, this, which are vegetable dyes, let's say work, silk screen, drawing. The um, silk screen, the yellow work, is called Krishna, le roi des Strong, Krishna, the king of the Smurf. I grew up in a Parisian apartment totally furnished with Indian artifact or Indian object. So outside the apartment was France, was Paris, was multicultural Paris. Inside the apartment was somehow a projected India. Uh, as a child, I was sleeping below miniatures uh, representation of the god Krishna. And parallelly, I was also reading the, the Smurfs. So as, as a child, I, I had both imagery in front of me, both iconography, and I thought they belonged to each other. Not because of the, you know, because they culturally don't belong to each other, but just because they were blue. So this is the kind of association I probably allow myself, or I mean, I don't know if I allow myself, but they, they happen, they happen in my mind. And this is also the mind space from which I'm doing art or I'm dealing with my iconography as well. Another piece from this series. I'm not going to describe every work because otherwise we are there for two hours. I have also to watch the time, okay. And here we are going to look at another body of work which is called uh, Somewhere Between Love and Fighting. So if you have laser eyes, you might see in this picture the wine color lines. And the wine color lines are depicting bodies, entangled bodies. Those bodies are coming, are inspired by the miniature of the Hamza Nama. This is a detail of the large curtain that we saw also in the exhibition. The Hamza Nama. Uh, so Hamza Nama, the epic of Hamza, narrates the legendary exploits of Amir Hamza, an uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, who fight against the enemies of Islam with his band of heroes. This manuscript of miniature painting 
has been commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Akbar, whose reign between 1556 and 1605. And this particular manuscript of um, Mughal miniature, I mean, Akbar being a Mughal emperor, sorry if I didn't say that before, has been uh, realized between 1562 and 1577, so quite a long period of time. So it, it is a very interesting piece of art because we, we are at the early stage of Mughal miniature. The Mughals are invaders in India. They have a lot of connection to Persia and they bring all the artists, many art, Persian artists in India. So there is, let's say, a kind of a multicultural environment at the court of the Mughal in those times. M Mughal miniature are in general, in general, you know, they are illustration for books, so they are quite small. But this specific manuscript is kind of double size. It's like about 70 centimeter high. And it has a fusion of the style of Indian and Persian miniature. And it is somehow a key, there are key works uh, in the formation of what will become Mughal miniature, the Mughal miniature style, which will develop from that also. So we are addressing you know, a hybrid genre of painting because of the, dif the cultural diversity it embraces. And it is here a very early phenomenon of transculturality, a phenomenon of proto-globalization. I mean, Akbar himself, created a syncretic cult, which was called the Din il Ilahi, which was a cult mixing Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, Mazdaism, Judaism, yeah, Judaism, I think I already said, and Christianity. Although this is court art, this is not art from the people. So let's not forget the kind of a power structure it also addressed. So I'm very interested with how the bodies are depicted, how the bodies the vivid style of it, how the bodies are intertwined into each other as a kind of a, creating a kind of a collective body, a society in formation. No, a genre searching for itself. There is something in the making of, of it. And then come my, my work. So, I mean, here, and very directly reused. And uh, those paintings are working as, let's say, patchwork paintings, collages. And elements are painted, elements are sewn. So we probably online you will see a bit better because we have here quite a, a not so sharp screen. But just to see details. So. The big, the background is a ready-made fabric, and it's a kind of a jacquard uh, fabric, on which is sewn, sewn. I don't know how to put sewn. Flora, my my English teacher, sewn <laughs> fabric. And the painting has several layers of dyes, silk screen, and another other embroidered applications. And I use the motif of the Hamza Nama, but I transform it, I appropriate it, and then it's like a female experienced character who is throwing at a kind of a male, very official audience, a body full of women, a composite elephant. So somewhere between love and fighting, because we can't decide if it's love or it's fight, it's the ambivalence situation. Entangled bodies inspired from this manuscript and also the same patchwork system. The bretzel is an application, a sewn application, like, like this little star, the heart with the wings as well. Another one. So the paintings have no centers. And there is also a lack of, uh, of hierarchy. Okay. Applications. I think we see a bit better with the details. So everything. Yes, everything is somehow treated, you know, with no hierarchy. All the elements of composition are intertwined. 
and there is hardly a center and there is, let's say, an explosion of the motif or of the pattern on the surface of the image. Oh, another one. And those works are also very graphic. So do we, can we call them painting? I don't know. Sometimes, you know, especially since we are all together in a painting class looking at all your work, uh, I'm also sometimes questioning, am I a painter? Because my approach to painting is extremely graphic. <laughs> and I don't know where it comes from. I read a lot of comics. Uh, I look at a lot of mi Mughal miniature. And I think the, my, let's say, reference to painting is also different. I mean, it is coming from different sources. I mean, Mughal miniature doesn't work as uh, European painting history. I'm not really modeling in the shape. So call it how you want. I don't have another world. <laughs> so now we are going to look at Kalam Karis and let's say uh, works that are involving craft. I mean, the others were also involving craft. But the, those works are involving, let's say, several hands and sometimes collaborations. So Kalamkari is a, a technique of painting with vegetable dyes coming from India. It's a traditional technique that has been used for many, many years to depict, um, let's say, the big epics of Hinduism, to create uh, an imagery, to to display in temples, but also through times, also enter the field of textile manufacture with block printing. So it's a vegetable dye technique on cotton fabric. You, we use a kalam, a, a pen. We create all the outline with jaggery, which is a kind of a sugar, and those black lines create a border. And inside, we put the dyes and they melt. And of course, the fabric is prepared before. I'm not able to do that fully on my own. I know how to do it, but it, take, it would take me one year to do one fully well. So I had the chance to be introduced by my aunt, uh, Soraya Asanboz, who dedicated her whole life to Indian craft textile, uh, to Mr. Kailashan, who is a master of Kalankari. And we are working together. Here are some details, so you can see how the, the color or the vegetable dyes are soaked in the, in the fabric. I'm not talking, I don't want to talk too much about what I'm depicting here, but let's say that the, the iconography or the, the depiction of those kalamkaris, uh, let's say we can say that comic subculture is somehow and the narrative structure of, of it, the formal narrative structure of it, are meetings, are meeting Indo-Persian miniature composition somehow. And we also have several characters, and those characters are, are called Femme Foundation, which we will speak a bit about, look at it a bit later on in the presentation. Here, again, the past patchwork painting with all the sewn layers. Kalamkari are also present in those works. This kind of scarf shape, more or less middle, middle right here. And here, hopefully, you can see details of how they are, they are sewn. And I also see that there is a stitch which is not supposed to be there. So those paintings work very much more organically. I was, I mean, I'm often uh, depicting figures in my work, female experience figures. And I was a bit with this area wondering, OK, can I do paintings with no figure? How would it work for me? <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a way for me to, <clears throat> let's say, there is also no center and like uh, also, you know, push away the 
anthropocentered attention of the images, and this is a bit depicting, you know, process of growing, process of life. You know, there is a lot of kind of cell formation, plants. So they are very uh, organic. And sometimes, because I mean, a painting takes time to do. Uh, it's not only about like focusing on the topic. It's many hours of contemplation in the studio, and there are some elements of the studio that are suddenly interfering the purpose of the painting. So here there are some glasses, or I see a bit below, if you see, there is a scissors which enter the picture. The glasses are also here. Maybe the glasses also address the gaze, or the gaze is very important, like who is looking at what, from which perspective in my work. About collaboration, um, this is one of them. So those are co-signed work, Mohibul Lanouri and Nadira Hussein. Uh, Mohibul Lanouri is a friend of mine from Afghanistan, and he is a tailor. And we always wanted to do something together. So we brought, let's say, our habits, our, our techniques, our knowledge together, and we decided to create um, those pictorial, let's say, clauses on jeans to address also this, let's say, global level of uh, clothing ourselves, but on outfits, on clothes which are also existing in India and in Afghanistan. So we decided to call this one a Perahan, according, I mean, Moheb won for this one. This is Afghanistan, but I could call it a Kurta if I would like to relate to Indian clothing. This is another piece of that, of this series, and worn. Mohed is on the right. Also, bus robes. I mean, it's hard when I approach a painting, I don't see a white square. I see a piece of fabric. What can I do with this piece of fabric? Uh, this piece of fabric, shall it goes always on the wall, or how can it relate to, to our bodies, to our everyday experience? Does it have a use value also? And here I worked with my aunt and we created those bathrobes. And bathrobes, they are in between clothing because they are, you don't go in the public space, you don't go outside in the street with them, technically but they are a way to dress up in your domestic environment. So there is really something dealing with negotiating with the domestic and the, maybe the politics of the domestic in, the, yes, in this sphere. And now we found again uh, Bastard. Batard. So this series is called Manzil, and Manzil means, uh, means home. In, in Urdu, at least. I want to quote a sentence from a novel which is called The Art of Losing from Alice Zeniter, who is a relatively young uh, French Algerian novelist who is also who is addressing issues of migration uh, in, her, in, in this particular book. She, she wrote, What hasn't been passed on is lost. You come from here, but it is not your home. This sentence really resonates a lot to, to, to me. So there is not a lot of art history written about the cultures of migration from the perspective of migrants and their children. I mean, I'm not so interested in cultural specificities, but I'm rather interested in what culture of migration could be about, and I don't have really a clear answer for that. So through the experience of migration, our identities transform because of being closely in touch with several places and the culture they relate to. But let's say that our bodies are only located at one place in a time. So it always creates somehow the feeling of an absence. I personally lived and grew up in France and India was not there, but was extremely present in some objects 
in the food, in some smells, in stories, in family visits, sometimes in trips, and especially in, in my father, in everything, in the ex just existence and presence of my father. So there is something about an invisible um, trans trans transmission. So this, let's say, intangible knowledge is very curious, I mean, to, to me. And I personally have a kind of a, of a need to, to, to regain what has been lost somewhere or what is not tangible all the time. And this can be done probably through imagination, through narratives, I would say through embodied narrative because I'm an artist and I put this into forms. And I would say that, let's say, the first generation of migration, they, they had to, they were busy with other things, you know, they were busy with fighting, they were busy with uh, bureaucracy, they were busy with some traumas, with legal issues, with adapting the new environment. But what the second generation can do, I think the second generation has maybe the distance to address the culture of the experience of our parents and as well our culture. So this is a bit what the space where I'm evolving in. The series, so this series is called Plastic Manzil. This is digital collages based on photos I took in my family house in India. They are photo material and I really use photo material. So I cover the photos with various patterns and imagery as if reality could only be seen through a screen. Something like a Jalil. A Jalil is a type of window that we find a lot uh, in India. I mean, in my, it's, you know, I don't know the word in, in another language, but it's, it's windows with no glass, with some kind of ornamental and holes. So when you are inside, you can see through and look at the outside, but from outside, you don't really see inside. So this is a bit the logic of those works, like of those kind of collage works. And this system, this Jalil window system, allow me to create a tension between opacity and transparency, what you can touch, what you can see, what you can address, what is resisting you, the perception and the experience. So let's say this filter creates some kind of a distance from the reality of the photo, but it also melts into it. So I'm, I'm appropriating the idea of home or, or, or the home I, I didn't grow up in, and I'm appropriating it also for, for my father. And uh, yes, and this is also the home of, the, of my Indian family, and they went through uh, India independence, they refused to go to Pakistan and they lived through the transition of a feudal regime into a neoliberal nation in about, you know, in about 70 years, maybe less. So the house, this house, this particular house, remains an island of nostalgia in a forest of shopping malls. In this series, it's still the photos of home, of the home, the house in India, which I also covered with transformed miniatures, depicting often women couples. Yes. Cosmic Trip is also a series. So what happened here? Here we have a hybrid creature, which is Alborak. Alborak is a mytholo mythological Islamic figure. She is a horse who can fly with a female head. She brought Muhammad the prophet to a mystical trip to visit all the prophets in one night, the Mirage. And she meets, she carries in her own body a population of Smurfs, which are a bit packed in her body, in a composite body, which is a typical way, like it's a trope also in Mughal miniature. Alborak meet the Smurfs in a composite style, a hybrid. Mm -hmm. 
Et un autre oiseau savant ça, and another bird approach, is a ceramic floor piece, which is about 3 meter by 3 meter, hand painted with a ceramic mat like glaze, proper glaze. It is a work which is inspired by the conference of the bird, of the birds, a Persian poem by the Sufi poet Farid Uddin Attar. The birds of the world are gathering and they want to meet the supreme bird. Who is the supreme bird? They go through a lot of, you know, each bird has some specificities. They tell their stories. The narrative of the conference of the birds is full of digression. There's story inside the story inside the story. Till they, at some point, arrive to where the supreme bird is supposed to be, above a mountain, in front of a lake. They look into the lake and they expect Simrog, they expect the supreme bird, but what they find in the lake, their own reflection. This is principle of Sufism. Mirroring the inner to the outside. The heart melts with all the elements and the inner feeling has a the self, the inner self, has a resonance with the cosmos. So this, let's say, this perception which comes from Sufism, which comes from many, I mean, Sufi readings I had, uh, storytelling from my family, from my uh, grandparents. I mean, I found also there a way of how to, let's say, push away borders of perception. So the work has also been exhibited in nature, so the reflection of the sky on the, on the, on the, on the floor, and some details. And we will finish with the last category, like, let's say the last chapter. So Femme, Fondation, Femme Fondation, as Batard, uh, I call that concept form in my work. Maybe it's a way for me to, to organize, to classify things. So, Femme, fond fond Femme Fondation, she is a role model, she is an avatar, she is an alternative to male domination, to patriarchal structure. Foundations, you know, male domination, patriarchy, patriarchal structure are so deeply rooted in our society, in our psyche, that it operates a bit like deep architecture. So often in my painting, Femme Foundation appear as a karyatid, you know, like karyatid, they are like those kind of sculpture which are holding architecture. So I want to give her this foundation role in my work also. She's a hybrid. She's a furry. So if you are not familiar with furry, furry uh, are coming, like they are, they are, let's say, coming a lot from the comic world and they are, uh, hybrids, animals, human, they are tierranthrop, so they don't, they, they are not anthropocentered. And here I'm consuming a lot of, of manga, and this is, um, just to show you here, this is a love pistol, this is a yahoi, so a erotic uh, manga made by women depicting boys' love for a female audience. And, Femme Foundation is very much a fairy coming from this, this, this uh, subculture. So here we see some paintings on a wall uh, sticker intervention. So here it's more a hybrid who has a lot of bodies in her body, who has a lot of arms and legs. Also. Here there is a reference to miniatures. And why her, you know, like she exists because, I mean, I told, so, I told you, I mean, many people here, are, we are spending now a lot of time together in the class, but I, I actually, I started drawing with, uh, with, stor with telling stories because I remember I missed a lot of characters, of interesting characters when I was watching movies or reading some books as a child and this was creating a lot of frustration. So I started drawing to create those creatures that I was missing. 
and it leads to a big database, let's say, database production of uh, hybrid creature who had uh, many members, many organs. They were not really humans. They were like somehow animals. They were they were plants. They were uh, robots. And um, this is how all those. I mean, I didn't change a lot. Just what I want to say. Maybe the skills improved a bit. <laughs> just to see a bit the scale of the painting or how they can be presented in the space. So here, Farm Foundation is a mother and uh, is a half horse. This is called Ekilov. How oh, it is in the space. Um, foundation as kind of graffiti meets cave painting uh, <laughs> in a ex like a room installation, and we end on yellow. <laughs> <laughs> we started with blue, but it was not visible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is it different if you show in France or in Germany or in India? Or? Yes, it is, it is different. I think, um, uh, I mean, first when I started, I started everything from Germany. And when I started to show in Germany, I encountered a lot of resistance because of, let's say, the whole ornamental uh, aspect of my work, because this was a bit problematic in the way how that ornamental is related to maybe decoration and it's not very valuable, while for me ornamentation is the way how I can transport narratives. It's also full of, uh, of like, let's say, yes, full of, of life or like, I mean, uh, the, the Koran is written uh, in ornaments, for example. And uh, when I show in Dubai or when I show in India, totally different audience, totally different culture. So for example, there are pieces that I rather not show. Uh, I mean, it's not that I restrict myself, but it is more that showing a work is also about uh, entering in a conversation with a, an audience. And I, let's say my work is not, I'm not there bang, bang in your face, you know, like uh, this is me, I think like this. Uh, I can be bold sometimes, but you know, it's also more hybrid, more negotiating. So I, I, when I exhibit in India, people also are much more careful with like all the, the ornamentals, with like the, how it is hewn, like the craft aspect. Uh, while less maybe in Europe, they are more looking at the iconography, but it's different, yeah. Yes. Yes, please. I had a question. You mentioned the notion of nostalgia, and I, I wanted to ask maybe to explore a bit what you meant. I mean, I kind of saw elements of it, mm. but that's kind of a new concept for me in your work. It's obvious that it's there now. Yeah. You mentioned it. I see, but I would be curious to know more about your use of nostalgia, what it means to you, mm. how you transform it. Yes. Uh, because probably you didn't hear uh, the question of Florage. It's a question asking me to develop a bit more on the notion of nostalgia in my work. So, yes, I think the nostalgia maybe touch a bit what I was explaining with like the, the absence, you know? Like, so when there is a, a transmission of something which you can't touch, you also project a lot on it but it's totally present in you, but also intangible. So I think the nostalgia maybe comes from, from there and could also maybe be related a bit to a certain idea of melancholy. Something is lost, you know? And, um, and I'm not talking only about my own experience. It's also the experience of 
what my family transmitted me. The, the, my family had really to go through radical changes uh, through the process of decolonization, Indian independence. I mean, and they really turned from fed, feudal, feudalic uh, social system. And I have to say that they were also pretty uh, um, yes, uh, um, established, you know, people. They had a cultural access, they, they, they were not poor. And the entry of hard capitalism totally destroyed them. And this is not only the history of my family. In Hyderabad, so many houses are working the same. You know, at the independence, all the um, families had to give back every object which is older than the 19th century to the state, but to a state where, would, would, which was actually for my family an enemy also. My grandfather, because of not wanting to go to Pakistan and wanting to keep Hyderabad independent, a bit like what Kashmir wants, you know, still does, he went to jail for eight years. So they keep all those, the past um, elements at home, secretly in locked house where malls, you know, grow all around the place. And when I go and I spend time with my family in India, there is also always not only the migration thing of the father, but there is also the whole history of India just arriving in the face like this from this nostalgic perspective. So this is a bit what I want to say. And I think, I mean, not that I want to enter too much there because I'm not so, so uh, intellectual, but Hobi Baba talking about the third space also enter this idea of mimicry, of imitating, of nostalgia also, which I can relate to. Shall we have a drink? Yeah. No? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm curious because um, your paintings tend to be really, really, really dense. Yes. And I'm curious to the process of how you manage to keep the dense and also the comes together. Okay. Um, I was asked, so the, the painting tend to be very dense. How do I come to this process or this manner? Uh, I'm not very good at discriminating, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not very good at creating hierarchies, and I don't know, the eyes can take a lot of layers, can take a lot of form. And, uh, and I think there is also a way of creating a kind of a synesthetic effect, you know, a bit of form of polyphony, a visual polyphony. And how do I go there? I mean, technically, maybe, um, I mean, yeah, it's hard to self-reflect on that, you know, because I'm in the studio, I, I do, I start always, I have, you know, entrances to the work. Uh, I have a lot of, you know, let's say, graphic sketches of forms, and I say, okay, this is the world for now, I enter, I start with this, and then I grow, it grow, and, you know, it's at the end, painting or is, is a practice of putting elements in relationship to each other. So sometimes, you know, they come on the top of each other, sometimes they come on the side, sometimes they came through transparencies. And I really tried to create a um, harmonious relationship, dissonant relationship. You know, I tried to really bring a kind of a, how the complexity of, of uh, some kind of social bodies in the painting, maybe. I mean, I don't know if it's really true, but it sounds good, you know. <laughs> Ah, yeah, um, I, I was present in hybrid at this first one and then I came. <laughs> so um, I, I, was, I'm, I was curious about, on the one hand, you're talking about the fact that you're not an intellectual, but you use a lot of concepts, right? You have the that you coin yeah. somehow, you speak of polyphony. So, so yeah, how, how, what is the power for you of these concepts, of coining these, these concepts, and how do you use them? Or what? Why do you need them? You're not untidy, you have different characters. So there's an yeah, interesting thing. Um, so I, I try to organize the yeah, question yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my head. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not an intellectual in the sense that I'm not studying in the academic you know, world, but I read. And maybe my, I read and I take a lot from my readings and from what people, certain people thought, you know, develop in the academic field. And 
support also my way of thinking and of looking at the world and maybe doing art. So, but what about the concept forms? This is maybe, um, I would say it's a bit structural, um, a structural manner that it uh, helps me to to think, to organize, and to develop the thinking. So, you know, I, I, I would not be able to work just with concepts. Uh, I need to transform them in forms. So I need to, let's say, create a symbol of this concept or a sign of this concept. And then I need to I articulate all those. It's very structural, you know, I articulate those elements together and trying to say something, but the ending is not, I don't write a text, I write an image. I don't know if this is answering a bit. I mean, I, I don't really... No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, was it like a discovery when you, this concept of Patal, how did it come to you? Was where you said, wow, it's like something I can work with, I can explore, mm. um, or the hybridity even? No, no, so... With me, with my cognition, it's much more simple. So, the, you know, it's like how I think it starts with bata, bat, bata, which sounds also very proper to the, you know, Hindu and Urdu uh, mouth. And then bata, the shop, and then bata, bata, you know, it's also a bit like a hip hop thing. Mm -hmm. So it comes like that. And then bata, yes, of course, bata, you know, like I'm a fucking bastard. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm constantly, you know, oh, you're not French, you're not European, oh, you're not Indian, you're not that, you know, so it, it join and join. And then, you know, uh, homie baba, okay, yes. And it's like putting things together, it's associative thinking, but not, it, it, it pop, it pop, you know, it pops. It's not like I see it and I think, and it comes a bit like it comes a bit like poetry also, like slam. And, and sorry if I go on a little bit, but mm. and then the concept allows you to then explore, then you like better tapping on your work as well, or is the concept a posteriori? You're doing something and you're like, oh, but tap actually fits what I'm doing here. Or is there a relationship between both, mm. where you have the concept and then yeah. you're like, and and then I go into space and you know? Yeah. I think it grew together very much, you know, like as a painting practice, you know, the pr practice which is very, let's say, embodied, like very physical paint material, but then the th the thinking and you know because it's like I'm doing that maybe for more than ten years, so there is not ah I start from zero, it it grows together, and let's say that those concepts, maybe concept is maybe not the right word, maybe we can say they are methods. Maybe we can say that concept is maybe not the right word. Maybe another word could be a method of work. You know, a method of work, a principle, um, a category, a, a realm. But it, it grows together, you know, it's not I'm sitting, okay, I'm going to do bastard work. I'm, <laughs> you know, uh, all the works are bastards. <laughs> Hybridity is following my work all the time. Femme Foundation is there all the time. And they are in and out the art. Femme Foundation are addressed the fairy world. I'm a fairy fandom fan, you know. I, it, I go, I mean, uh, I could, I could, could, can costume myself also. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's also maybe because end of the day, as artists, we are not just doing what we do and showing what we do. We also, I mean, I know what, are we, what I'm doing now, I, I, I'm trying to speak about it. And, uh, and how do you communicate with world images? So, Probably this is also a method of of communication. So there are words that crystallize, in, you know, ideas, and maybe uh, maybe make it a bit easier for you to ac access or understand or have an idea of what I'm doing. But they can be mantras. They can be fetishes, also. So I have to
Yes. Okay, so okay. thank you very much, Nadira. I really liked your talk. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> very good insight into your, into your methods of working. Yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much for being there.